Welcome to the Rap Race to Buy podcast, where we discuss money, mindset, real estate investing, and ways to achieve financial independence. Whether you are a rookie or a veteran needing new ideas for investing or creating side hustles, you're in the right place. Here to challenge you to think out of the box, your hosts, Felipe Mejia and Diego Corzo. Diego, what's up, dude? How are you? What's up, Felipe? Excited that you are back. Oh, man, I know. COVID really kicked my butt. Uh, today, we have a very special guest, a good friend of mine. Uh, her name is Christina Minio. She's done three and working on her fourth flip in Atlanta. But what's really cool is the creative financing, the letter she had to write to the uh, to the city of Atlanta to get her second property, a hundred thousand dollar flip on her third property, uh, and all the struggles that she said she's had to go through to do this. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's really cool. And one of the main things that I took away from this podcast was the importance of, of having the right team. We mentioned this a lot, but your investor friendly realtor, your lender and the contractors at work can make or break a deal. I agree 100 percent. She crushes it. Let's get right to it. But right before that, let's uh, talk real quick about our sponsor. Hey, guys, if you want to skip where the pros skip, uh, skip trace their information, make sure you go to skipbetter.com. And for 11 cents, you can skip trace and pay only for the results that come back. Cool. Let's get to Christina. Christina, welcome to the Rat Race to Five podcast. We're super excited to have you. I'm super excited because I know some of the behind the scenes, uh, not the full story, so we're super excited to have it. Diego, if you don't know, Christina is an awesome entrepreneur in Atlanta. Uh, she's flipping properties out there, but we'll let her tell her story. Christina, tell us who you are, 30,000th of you, what you do, and uh, we'll go from there. Well, thank you for having me on. Uh, my name is Christina. I'm 30 years old. I grew up in New York, but we moved to Atlanta almost three years ago. It's about two and a half years now. And we came to Atlanta to start investing in real estate, my husband and I. And so I'm designing the projects financially, designing them physically like the kitchens. Um, and then I'm self-managing the ones that we have to and looking for new ones, all the good things. I'm just running that end of the business for us. Oh my gosh. So you came from, you came from New York and moved down to Atlanta. You said you guys did, uh, did that for real estate. So tell us about that. How was that shift? Uh, actually, before we do that, we'll, we'll let the audience kind of cliffhanger there. Did you go to high school and, and, uh, and, or if you went to college in New York or kind of give us some backstory there? So I'm born and raised in New York and I went to high school and college up there. Sheesh. Um, so yeah. During high school, I was kind of like a quiet, shy kid that just stuck my head down and got straight A's because I'm Puerto Rican, but I went to a major majority white school and it was just very clear that I did not fit in and belong. We'll put it that way. <laughs> so I just didn't interact with many people and was like getting things done that I needed to. And I started working at a pretty young age too, at like 14. Um, and I feel like that's a common story in a lot of children of immigrants that you just where, start where did working you work? young. Well, one of my first jobs was like at the mall and then I did a bunch of other things, you know, summer camp counseling, all the classics. And by the end I was working at Panera, which was by far my favorite job and most oh, really? delicious. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I should get my wife to work at Panera so she stops spending the money there. Like that would be great. I feel it's like I at least so want good. to get <laughs> that's so funny. So Dude, Felipe, uh, I'm for yeah. for for eight ninety nine a month, you can uh -huh. get unlimited coffee at Panera now. So Dude, I don't know, Diego, if you have a if you have a girlfriend, but women don't work that way, bro. I can try to convince my <laughs> wife to do a ten ninety nine for some coffee, but she's gonna be like, nah, I'm good. I'll, I'll pay go ten dollars every shop. time for Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Go She'll go somewhere else. Uh, no, I'm I need that eight ninety nine for their bread. That's what I need. Bro, their <laughs> bread is fire. I'm not gonna lie. Except the one time I went to Panera with my wife, and I never went again. This is why. My wife ordered a half a grilled cheese, and first of all, I was like, "You can get half a grilled cheese? Like they don't even give you the whole thing. So what do they do with the other half?" And it was like three ninety nine. Diego, three ninety nine for half a grilled cheese. I never went back. I was like, "Yeah, babe, <laughs> don't take me through this drive through I'm not gonna do this." That's um, funny. Anyways, so Christina, I'm curious about, um, and then we're gonna we're, we're we're gonna run through this, but I'm curious about bodegas in in New York. What is that? Because I hear it all the time, but are, but is it like our street markets, like on the corner stores? What is a bodega? 
So bodegas are the greatest thing about New York and the thing that I miss the most. Mm. So they're most likely corner stores that have anything you need. They have mostly, uh, most of them have a sandwich bar, like, you know, a deli mm. shop that yep. you can get sandwiches. And I never realized how much I depended on that sandwich man until I left New York. Mm. And the other great thing about New York is that everything is fast and a lot of things are cheap and accessible. So the bodegas are a huge <coughs> pulse of everybody that lives in New York. And if you just need milk really quick, bread really quick, eggs, the bodega's right there. If you want chips and a sandwich and you're on the way to work, you can eat it on the train. They help fuel and keep New Yorkers going. And I miss that so much because in Atlanta, it's not as easy to get convenient and inexpensive and semi-healthy food. That makes sense. So it's funny. I got a quick story, a chip on my shoulder about New York, and then we can move on. I went to New York and I never went back because uh, I was born and raised in the South. So it's a little bit slower here. I went to New York. I went to a pizza store because you got to get pizza in New York. You just got to. I went to one of the pizza places and I remember I walked in. I was in line because it was a giant line. I got in line and I pulled up to the guy that was in front and he was like, what do you want? And I was like, um, I think I'm going to, and he served, no joke, three people, three people while I was trying to figure out what I wanted. And it was like pepperoni, cheese, or sausage. Like that was it. And I was like, uh, ah, I think I'll have pepperoni, You're done. sausage, <laughs> cheese. I was like, I'll take a pepperoni. Thanks. I was like, man, I didn't even get to like, what if I wanted, it was like that. Is that what the bodegas are like, Christina? Oh, a hundred percent. And New Yorkers have their own bodega language too. Oh like my gosh. bacon, egg and cheese, salt, pepper, ketchup is one word. That is not a word. And the bodega that guys is, that is understand that. it. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Anyways, sorry, Dig. I didn't mean to get into that, but I, I knew no. that story was going to be good. Christina. Um, okay. So you went to high school and college there. Uh, you said you were pretty introverted. Uh, you kind of kept to yourself. Was it the same in college? Uh, what did you study or what did you do in college? Tell us about that. In college, I branched out a little bit more because in college, I made friends with more people who were like me, mm. but it was still the same grind. I went to school part-time and worked part-time through college. So it took me six years to finish my bachelor's. Um, and I was paying my own way through college and helping my parents with some bills. Good so it was a lot going on. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where did the entrepreneurial spirit come? Because we obviously you're here because of real estate. So you got an entrepreneurial spirit. Where did that come from then? Because you said you went straight to work at 14. And then during high school, you're pretty introverted. And you also worked there. Um, college, you put yourself through college as well as helped your parents. So it sounds like you've always had a job. So where did the entrepreneurial spirit uh, come from? That's a great question. So my husband is a recording artist. And he tours and travels for most of his living. So we got married pretty young. I was 22 and I didn't even, I actually hadn't graduated college when we got married. I took a semester off, got married and then finished the following semester. Atta girl. Um, and he's always, thank you. He's always been very entrepreneurial. And because of his lifestyle, <laughs> I learned very quickly that it was going to be very hard for me to hold down a traditional job mm. and still have some kind of a healthy marriage. And I've met people who have been able to balance that but those tensions were not one that I was willing to put up with. So okay. it took me several years to kind of build what that meant for me. And I tried different things like getting my cosmetology license and becoming a hairdresser in New York because that had kind of unconventional hours that didn't work out. And then we ended up moving to Atlanta and getting into real estate down here. So it sounds like you were trying to like, fit in where you get in, I guess, kind of like in your marriage because of the schedule that your husband had. And then you were like, is that kind of like, it almost sounds like it came out of necessidad que tenías que encontrar something that you wanted to contribute. Am I, am I, am I, am I feeding that right? I don't want to put words in your mouth. That's right. I'm, I mean, I'm like a strong willed Latina and I, I grew up working at a young age and, and I from was New York. Oh my gosh. Yes. No, <laughs> so I was never okay with not being able to provide for myself, even though my husband was providing well for our needs. Mm -hmm. I wanted also something for myself to never lose my own identity and my own power. And not that that's always tied with money, but that was important for me at right. that time. Well, it sounds like at 14, you were helping provide for your family, college and all that. So it sounds like 
sounds like that was already built in you. And then running into your marriage, uh, you know, it's, you weren't just going to stop, especially since you started at such a young age. Sounds like you were definitely going to be like, yo, I'm doing something whether you like it or not. So, so I, I definitely love that. And at rat race to fight our mastermind, we really encourage and empower women to get out there into real estate, even though it's like a male dominated industry. It's like, that doesn't matter. Let's change that. And especially with Latino, um, just, you know, Diego and I are Latinos that we're, not only do we empower women, but if, if, if you're like a woman and a Latina even more, how can we get you resources to help you to push forward? So let's move on to real estate. Uh, that gives us a little, a little bit of backstory. That's amazing. Um, Talk to us about real estate in Atlanta. What the hell happened? Yeah, and also, and also, what uh, like why real estate? Did you read a book? Yeah. Did you yeah, have conversations? Go. What was what it was all about? That's a great question. So, I mean, we started like the classic way, which was reading Rich Dad Poor Dad, <laughs> and after reading that book, I got really intrigued. And because both of us come from families that did not have money. Uh, my, my husband's mom, unfortunately passed a couple years ago. And when she passed, she left her kids like $200 each. And my parents are not super financially stable right now. And I, as a Latina, it's one of the things that we struggle with, especially the firstborn, you feel responsible for your parents no question, at all actually. times. <laughs> so I was very aware of the burdens that I felt like I had to carry. So both of us were very open to the fact that if we continue going the way that we're going this traditional route, we're not going to make enough to do everything we not want to do. So we need to take a step back and educate ourselves on finances in general. And through those studies, and obviously Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and different books, then we, speci we specialized in real estate as a form of helping us get there. So y your husband was also from New York? Yes, but he's from a different part of the state. So I'm from New York City and the suburbs, and he's from Syracuse, New York, which is about like four hours away. Okay. And then he went to college in New York City, and that's how we met. Got it. Okay, so different parts of the state, but that's how you guys are met. Then you guys decided to move to Atlanta. Um, you started educating yourself on finances, on, uh, and then you landed on real estate because of, I'm assuming because Rich Dad Poor Dad, and, and, and through your studies, you found real estate and said, this is probably a, a good way to build wealth. Am I tracking? Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, perfect. So can you name one other book, aside from Rich Dad Poor Dad, that you would say has been very impactful or anything, a mentor, or, or what's another impact that you had, and then we'll move into real estate? So I'll definitely, I mean, I have to talk about bigger pockets because I just ran through those books. I think we all and did. Actually, I think we all Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, after there was a moment when I was a hairdresser that I decided that life wasn't for me because it was taking an incredible toll on my body. And I stopped working at the salon, took eight months off. And for eight months, all I did was study. So I was reading books, listening to podcasts, watching YouTube, just absorbing all this information. And most of it, if not all of it, was from bigger pockets and talking to different people in my life. So that was like where most of this came. Don't, don't worry about it. People, if that happens all the time, we get kids to running or cats. You're good. <laughs> um, yeah, I think a lot of us have been positively impacted by bigger pockets, including myself, especially Brandon on his podcast. Um, and a lot of the books have really just opened up our mind to the opportunities of real estate. So I, I think that's huge. And uh, and I think everyone should go listen to the OG Bigger Pockets uh, if they haven't. And, and you can get a wealth of information. In fact, uh, Christina, I, I did the same thing. Um, I, I didn't quit my job, but for like six or seven months, unloading U-Haul trucks, which that was my job, you know, you know a lifetime ago. Um, I would just listen to podcasts. I'd have my AirPods on and I would just be unloading the trucks because I didn't want to think about the physical labor that I was doing. And I would just listen to podcasts and people's stories. And after a while, I was like, why can't I do this? Like, I belong just as much as anyone else. And it took me forever to accept that. Um, so tell us about uh, your first deal. What was uh, what happened? How did you dig in? How did you dive in? Um, everyone is scared of that first one. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that. Well, we thankfully got connected through a friend to a real estate agent who was an investor. And we were meeting with him while we were still living in New York, described to him what we wanted. And at that time, we weren't pressed for time to move to Atlanta. So I was willing to wait for the right deal. Right. And 
I calculated a bunch of parameters based on how much money we were going to have for the down payment. And I kind of worked backwards. So I was like, okay, if we're going to, we financed it as a primary residence because we were planning on moving into it and then eventually moving out. Um, so I was like, okay, if we have this amount of money and it's a 5% down, I think it was like, like we had like 40,000 or something to put down. And I was like, if that's 5%, we can do about a 500 budget, a $500,000 budget, but that's including renovations. And I needed to rent up to like $5,000, like the 1% rule. So I spent a couple months looking for one. And then we found a house that was for sale for 350. It did not look good. It needed a whole bunch of work but we budgeted a hundred grand to put into it. So that would bring us at 450. And then the rent at that time, so this is 2019 pre pandemic, mm. the rents were going to get us to 4,000. And I was like, you know what? I'm comfortable with that because this is an up and coming area and the rate that these rents are going up, I think I'm going to reach 1% sooner than later. And then thanks to the pandemic that happened way faster than anybody was anticipating. But so, the loan that you got for your first, it was a, it was a flip, right? You had to, you had to upgrade the property and flip rehab it. Okay. it. You had to rehab it. So you got a primary. So was it a 203k loan? What was the loan structure that you got that would include rehab in the price? Cause I think you said that you had to get the rehab in the, so was it a 203k loan? Do you know what kind of loan structure you got there? So it wasn't an FHA loan, but it was a product from the lender that I had that was basically based off of a 201 3k loan. So it was yeah. their own product, but it wasn't an backed by the government, okay. but it was a, they called it a rehab loan that they would just lump the rehab in with the purchase price at the same interest rate, as long as everything checked out for them, which it did. And it was also owner occupant then. That's right. As well. But you didn't move in right away, right? You didn't move in while the rehab was going on? No, no, no. So Did we, they give you a we, time frame to move in or? No. No? Okay. I mean, so. I think I had to keep on in touch with them about kind of what was happening and when sure. we were able to move in, but they weren't giving me pressure. I just had to keep up, keep them in the loop. So then the rehab budget came out of the loan. So I'm assuming contractor come in, does X amount of work you go to the bank and get him a check. Is that kind of how that worked? So the bank would do the draws. So yes. there would be inspectors that would have to come out at certain points. So it's more burdensome on the contractor, but it's better for me as the investor because they have to really work with the bank on how things are done and the timing that they're done. And the bank is way more specific about certain things and then they'll add their inspections and then they release the draws. So also they don't get paid as quickly as if it was me with cash. So tell us how hard it was to find a contract that was willing to do that because I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, thank, thank God that with the connections that we made here and the agent that I mentioned before, he became a close family friend of ours and he gave us one of his contractors because at the time he didn't have a job for them and they're not on payroll, but he's one of their guys that he uses all the time and he's a developer. So they didn't have a job right now and they were like willing to take it. And again, this is like pre pandemic because it's a whole different world now. Yeah. What's interesting too about that is like you just mentioned three really key players for anybody that's investing in real estate. And that's something that some people may skip or they may miss or not put as much importance into it, which you mentioned the words like it was an investor friendly realtor, the lender that had the right program for you, right? And that goes by asking the right questions and working with the right lender and bank. And then the contractor and the contractor gave like it was a connection through your investor friendly realtor. And that's the important part of it. That's why we always push that within rat race. It's like your team is one of the most important things. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we were super blessed. So Sounds how, like it for sure. Yeah. And how long was the rehab time until you had to move in? Um, we closed August 7th, I think August, September, October. So it was about three months mm -hmm. of rehab. 
Um, it was mostly cosmetic stuff. We did have to remove some walls. Um, so it was like a heavy duty cosmetic job, but thankfully it wasn't anything super crazy. So with the, with the contractors, everything went smooth. Was there hiccups? Tell us a little bit about the process of actually getting the property where it needed to be. And then what was the end result? So this, this specific property was built in 1925. So she comes with a lot of baggage Mm -hmm. (laughs) and this one is actually a duplex. So there is like a mother-in-law suite on the bottom, which is a two one. And then there's a, there was a two one on top and we turned the front porch into a master bathroom. So we turned it into a two, two. Um, So the construction process itself, was not hard i think what was hard was the house the records for the house showed that it was a single family even though there was a mother-in-law suite in the basement and because of that the bank had certain parameters about what their money could be used on so the contractors couldn't really work in the basement too much because that was not considered like the main house so most of the money went to the upstairs so that was a little complicated, but we made it work. We were able to like get the basement rehabbed at a different time using our own money, but it also wasn't in a bad shape. I actually just recently found out that that um, property is legally a duplex, but someone at some point dropped the ball on how the city is recording this and the post office. So I have the fun task of untangling that web, but we're making it work. <laughs> now, are you... Or are you currently in that property now that you've rehabbed that you rehabbed? No, we have since uh, we bought that one in August of 2019, moved in October of 2019. And in March of 2020, we bought a crack house. <laughs> okay. Man, <laughs> I, I can't wait March to get into this story. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, your husband's a saint. I mean, Jesus, this is, this is probably one of those like fun stories where like, my wife is like, Hey, I got a project for us. But Christina comes home and says, Hey, you, we're going to buy a crack house. So we're going to get into that. So stick along for the ride. But before we get there, let's finish on the rehab. So you finished the rehab. Did you have to refinance into another loan? Did the loan roll over? Did the loan stay the same? Everything is done. You just, it just, uh, the rehab was done and then that's it. The rehab was done. The inspector comes from the bank, gives the con- contractors their last straw. Everybody's happy. And the loan remains the same. Okay. Which so, at that point, I think it was like a four point something interest rate. Okay. So then you moved into it for a little while and then you satisfied the, the, the amount of time you have to be in the house and then you bought a crack house. Yes. So what's interesting is that the purchase of the crack house, one happened to be the house directly next door to this current house that we're talking about. My first house. Wait a minute. Um, Hold on. I'm, I'm not going to let you just go over that. Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah. You can't just say that and then try to keep going. No, give me a second. So you bought this house, you rehabbed it next to a crack house. That's right. (laughs) And you moved your family into this. Oh, just you and your husband, because I don't think you have kids. So you moved your family into this. At what point, like, oh my gosh. Okay. At what point did you look out the window and say, I'm going to buy that crack house. I'm going to buy that one. Tell us that. So it was actually, I'm I'm like crying because I'm like, this is just, my life is a sitcom. It just keeps going. You need to write a book. (laughs) Yeah. As we were driving to like move into our house, I see a for sale (sighs) sign next door. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. So I'm like, we should just talk to them and see what's going on. So we talked to them. They were asking for way more than what I was comfortable paying. And we started some negotiations with them. We're able to come down. So we got under contract. Then the, the owner, the owner of the house was not trying to go down. I had heard rumors about where this guy was, but I didn't know for sure. And spoiler alert, it turns out, it turns out that the guy that we bought the house from was currently in prison as we're doing these negotiations. So I think he thought that he had a better understanding of the market than he did, or maybe even the condition of his house. And he was trying to like strong arm us into paying more. And I was just not having it. I was like, this is my top number. I will not go beyond that. 
So we ended up falling out of contract. He goes under contract two other times and both times they fall out. So I come back in and then I offer him less than what my original offer was and we close and I take it. (laughs) While while he was in jail? Oh, he's in jail this whole time. Oh, man. How did okay. how did the communication happen? Through his agent only. And then all the communication just lagged because they could only communicate at certain times, certain days. So it wasn't like, oh, let me get back to you and I hear back in an hour. It was like everything took a couple of days. Um, yeah, it was a wild so ride. The power of negotiation is, is, is huge here because one, you didn't, it's... It, Maybe you did behind closed doors or maybe you didn't, but it sounds like you didn't get emotional about this property and you just stuck to your numbers and your guns and you were like, this is what I can do. This is the only thing I'm going to do, whether it goes in or out of contract. Um, That's huge, Christina, because I think a lot of newbie investors, when they start, they get emotional about a property and they're, they're not willing to walk away. They say they are, they might think they are, but they're not willing to walk away. We're going to move on, but really quick, what was the mindset behind of like, I'm not moving from my purchase price. And in fact, you lowered it. <laughs> yeah. I just, I'm not a very emotional person in general. So I feel like I'm, I have very strong boundaries in life in general. Good and I was not willing, because remember the whole purpose of Andy and I getting into this is to help our families. Right. I was not willing to put myself in a compromising situation and then compromise my goal, which was my family. And if my family is my why, nobody's going to touch my family. So I'm not willing to give up a couple thousand dollars here and there to compromise that. So that's why I was very strong on that. I, I love that. The power of your why. And I think a lot of people don't have that, which is why they sometimes make emotional decisions because they don't have a reason as to why their purchase price is where it is, uh, aside from just an Excel sheet, which can't tell you everything. Okay, so you closed on the property, you purchased it from a dude in prison, um, (laughs) which is crazy. Talk to us about financing, the loan. How did all that work? I mean, are you just rich, made of money, you just bought it cash? What, I mean, what was the the situation? No. (laughs) So I spoke to the same lender that financed the first property because he helped me. He was so great. And I told him the situation that it was directly next door. It was currently a crack house. And you it was going to take a, a really long house? time. Oh, yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> I had to Sorry. be honest because I was like, man, is there any way that you could get me an owner financing loan again? And remember, this is March 2020, and I just got a loan in August 2019, so this is not a year yet. He, This is like a couple months shy of a year, and he was like, let me see what I can do, and I'll get back to you. So he came back to me and was like, I need you to write a letter to someone in the government and tell them what is happening. So I wrote a letter about me, my husband, the neighborhood that we were in. And I was like, look, I'm trying to, I love this neighborhood. I want to make this neighborhood better. This house is bigger for us. I want to move in there, but it's going to take me a long time to rehab it. Would you consider giving me an owner finance loan? Um, Because I'm not going to be able to move in for like another year. Um, Somehow it worked (laughs) and we were able to get owner financing again. Okay, hold on, wow. hold on, hold on. Yeah, I don't want to go past this because Diego's a realtor for many years now and he's, he's awesome. super, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is definitely tiptoeing that gray line between right and wrong. Not right and wrong, but what you're supposed to be able to do. So Diego, you're a realtor. She's not supposed to be able to do that. What well, happened? with the letter. Especially, well, especially letter, Diego, because mm-hmm. I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you go, but okay. especially because like I know, and you could correct me on this, that like you have to be able to justify why you can get out before that year by saying, hey, I'm a police officer and I can, I need to get to my job quicker or I'm a firefighter, I need to be able to save lives, so I need to be quick closer, so I need another loan. Christina moved 50 feet next door, so, which is hilarious. Um, Diego, how does that work? You're not supposed to be able to do that. Well, that letter, I bet you she wrote like magnificent things about the neighborhood, about probably that you're living in a 2-1 or 2-2 and that you need your space maybe through in the where we need this for our family, future kids, whatever. Um, and 
by giving the excuse that potentially like that it was a house that needed renovations they made some certain exception um but yeah i mean that is freaking awesome so there's there are, always a way there's always a way there's always a way and it was probably again it goes back to your team that lender probably did what he had to do to basically to get that loan to go through um so christina what was in yeah. the letter what did you say <laughs> it was to that? diego diego hit it spot on i was like we live in a two one this is a going to be a four three I was also like clear about what this, how this house is functioning. I was like, there's 12 people living in here right now. Um, eventually actually the house that I lived in. So our first house actually got broken into and I made sure to include that in the letter too. I was like, there's a lot going on with this house. And we were sure that it was tied to like the crack house. Um, please help me make this neighborhood better overall by being able to rehab this house because all the neighbors just want this house gone bro i'm telling you latina women are convincing bro <laughs> she moved to government like she right? changed she changed the laws for <laughs> her, bro. The law. i'm telling you i was I, I grew up with my sister man they're convincing they're gonna make things happen okay so you sent the letter you got the loan approved as a primary resident i'm assuming same type of loan that you got on the first one to rehab and then move in um Tell us the rehab project, what happened. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. So this house, as you can imagine, was not in good shape. And there was an extension on this house and it was all illegally done. So the extension was kind of raised above ground and two by twos were holding it up and not many of them either. It was a hot mess, a hot mess. Um, and it just smelled so bad when you walked in. It was awful. And the lot was not big enough for a larger, like a developer to come and tear it down and build something else. So the lot was not huge, but the house was in really bad state. So a regular homeowner was not going to want that either. So we redid everything in this house. Essentially, this house is a new build with the shell of the old house. Plumbing, electrical, HVAC, walls, floor, everything, everything is brand new. And of course we redid that extension and we made it a little bit bigger and did it all legally. So your first house, the one just next door, I guess you just rented that, that one out and then moved into the one you just finished. That's right. I mean, at first the, the first house was an Airbnb and then the pandemic happened and then we shut it down and I got a long-term renter in there in the upstairs. Cause we were still living downstairs. Once the rehab finished, which only happened of March, March of 2021. Um, we were able to move in and then we got other tenants in the basement. Mm, got it. Got nice. It. So now that property is producing revenue, that first house, and now you're living in. So then you had, then you bought that house, you rehab that one, use the same contractors, I'm assuming kind of all the same stuff that you did next door. Awesome. And then you did all the design and all that fun stuff. Mm hmm. What awesome. were the numbers on, on that home? So the second home, um, we bought it for 300 and we put 150 into it. So Jeez. both homes ended up at 450, which is impossible in this neighborhood now because of the real estate climate. What are they going for now in that area? I mean, so what was the crack house is could easily sell for like close to 800. Wow. which is wild so you have two and of then these the now. first house and yeah. i have two and the first house is smaller because it's like only a two two upstairs and then a, a it's a duplex so that one is probably like 700 but still so you have over half a million dollars in equity in the two properties together yes and Easy. that keeps me going because when okay. i want to quit i'm like this is paying me so much money <laughs> Okay. So what are you doing now? Um, have you rehabbed anything more after those two? Are you, what are you, what is Christina doing now in real estate? So last year we did another house in addition to finishing the crack house. So we rehabbed, we bought another house, rehabbed it and sold it. 
And then I'm also, I have another deal that I'm working on with actually my real estate agent who has now become my partner on a new deal that we're going to make a single home, a duplex by building a new house behind it. Nice. So the flip that you did before this deal that you're running through now, um, just really quickly, what was purchase price? Uh, what was sell price? What'd you profit on it? Um, I'm assuming you just took the lessons that you learned from the crack house. And I don't want to call it that anymore from the two houses that are side by side. Um, I'm, t I'm assuming you just took the lessons that you learned from that and jumped over and used that to rehab this property. 30,000 of you, what was purchase price? What was rehab and what'd you sell it for? So purchase price was 225. We rehabbed it for about a hundred. So like 325 okay. and then we sold it for 420. So almost a hundred thousand in profit on that. And that was all in like three months from close to sell. Dang, that's rushed. That's amazing. Wow. Wow. That, yeah. I remember seeing that house. I think I went to Atlanta and we actually got to see it. That's a really good three months. Wow. Good job. Thank you. I mean, I wasn't sleeping. I was like barely showering. We were just go, go, go. I wasn't doing the construction myself, but I was doing the design, managing the contractors, trying to get them the right materials. It was crazy. All while we had another rehab finishing up and then we moved. It was a hot mess. How, I don't how know what's wrong is, with me. Yeah, there's a lot going on there, Christina. <laughs> how um, is your husband involved in this or are you doing this by yourself? What is what is that? Yes and like? no. So he is involved like in the sense that I talk things out with him, but when it comes to the physical day to day, I'm doing all of that. So I'm the one on the laptop. I'm the one running errands. I'm the one talking to the contractors, but he is like, I go back and talk to him about everything and then we go together. Mm, got it. So it sounds like you make the decision, you go back and tell him the decision you made and then it gets done. Is that about right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, <something like> that. <laughs> that's what i figured that's what it really sounds like no I, I love it that's that's exactly my uh my sister and her husband's relationship he's super laid back and chill and he's just kind of lets her do her thing that's awesome so two flip three flips <coughs> you're working one now with your realtor um what advice christina would you give to someone starting out in real estate and is like man I, I, I understand where Christine is coming from. I want to do that too. Where would you tell him to start? Because it sounds like your team has been a crucial part of your investing. But yeah, where would you tell someone that, that wants to just get started and is like, man, I want to do that. I want to make half a million dollars of equity in two flips and $100,000 on another flip. And like, what, what, do you, what would you say? I would say one, your team is so, so important. And I think one thing that makes us entrepreneurs is that we're always looking for another way, a new way. And I feel like lenders, bankers are very traditional people in general. So I think that's such a key role because I think it might be a little bit tricky to find one that's open to something new and something a little bit unconventional and who can track with you and also has patience for you. My lender is a saint and he dealt with all my questions and just all my ideas and he was he's amazing that's yes. huge the other one is the hard days are just a moment and don't last forever <laughs> because okay. there are a lot of hard days and like you're pulling your hair out and i don't even know how many tears i've shed throughout this whole process because we're just giving highlights right but like Obviously. so much stuff has happened in between and I've spent so many days like crying and super stressed out and not being able to eat, but just remembering this is just a moment and I'm doing this to benefit myself. No one has my back harder than I do. Mm. And I respect myself too much to quit on myself. Let's go. So we have to keep going. That's awesome. Mm, I like That's that. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it goes between like having the right team, having the right why. Uh, that helps you push forward too with like the resources and just you like with having the understanding that is just like the pain or the, whatever it is, those like struggles and challenges, like there is a much, at the end, that's when you're going to get the actual reward of having, of being able to sell the house, being able to have that equity and, and all of that stuff. And the hard moment is one of the reasons why some people quit 
right? They might be like, hey, this is the last deal I'm doing. But if you just see what the reward is going to give you, you can keep going. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's huge. Wow. Um, there is a lot there. We might have to do a second podcast one day. Um, <laughs> so uh, really quick, because we're running out of time. What does the future of 2022 look like for Christina? What What is your goals and plans this year in regards to real estate? So we're working on this other, this fourth project, which is going to take up most of my year. Um, and we always have our eyes peeled for another one and we'll see how that goes. But if that doesn't happen, I really want to explore getting into designing homes specifically for investors, like money conscious people. So not people who this is their personal home and they want all their dreams, like people who just want to be up on the competition a little bit and still be money conscious, but want to have things designed beautifully. I think that's a niche that I'm really loving right now because I help other friends do this. So even though no one's paid me for that yet, I feel like I'm working to be able to give my service. You better to send people. them an invoice. Ain't none of this free. You can't stop playing, yo. Yeah, Here's my time. Is what I'm doing. Yeah, and you have a uh, lot of experience too now. Yeah, it so. sounds like it. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Um, uh, you did mention earlier that your husband is in. Uh, he's he's in the recording industry and, and things of that. He's not as involved in your projects, right? You're the one that kind of takes over. What does your husband do? So he's a rapper. I told you it's never normal or easy with us. <laughs> we keep it spicy. So he's a rapper. Oh, I know. I've listened to other here. podcasts. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. Guys, go Google Christina Minio uh, and go find the podcast that I'm talking about. Sorry, go ahead. What does your husband do? We're unashamed in a lot of different ways in most things about our life. So my husband is a rapper. His record label is also in Atlanta, which is also what brought us down here. And um, so he's constantly making music, going on tour, doing shows, all the things. I love it. I love it. So you, um, it sounds like you're investing his financing to make it grow and you're kind of nurturing that in you guys' relationship and using real estate to leverage your net worth to continue to grow to putting it in a safe spot. Is that, am I, am I reading that correctly? That's a hundred percent right. So he, wait, um, re really quick. Sorry. Paid, sure. It was during pandemic. So all artists got shut down during that time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's not like and you can we have say, employees. and you have employees. So it's not like you can say, Oh, I just took money from my husband and that's how we did all this because that's not true because during pandemic, no one was working, especially artists. That's right. And that was in the mix. Holy crap. That's a lot of stress. I can see why you said you didn't eat some days. Cause that could be like, Hey babe, we're going to buy this crack house while you're not even working. Like that. That's right. Yeah. That's crazy. That's right. Like, people aren't putting that one and two together. Wow. We have, that's a great story. Um, we have a saying that we ask each other all the time when you have days that you're like, man, I don't know if I can do this. So I'll tell him, Minio, do you bet on yourself? And he's like, every day. Let's go. That's Let's awesome. go. That's how we have to do it. You have get, to get like the be shirt okay made. Get the yourself. shirt made already. <laughs> get the shirt. I love it. I love it. Christina, where can the young 19 year old Puerto Rican, New York and girl find you and just like learn from what you're doing. Uh, so what's your social medias? So my Instagram is at Christina Minio and Christina does not have an H. It's the Spanish way of spelling it. C-R-I-S-T-I-N-A. Um, and that's probably where you can find me most. That's cool. awesome. Cool. Cool. Thank you so much, Christina. This yeah. was amazing. I love the story and I can't wait to see what like 2022 because I bet you, you might have some ideas, but the way that you're going, you're going to no, do gonna a lot of different five, projects. Yeah. Your business is going to grow. Thank you. So I'm excited for you. Thank you. We're super excited. Well, Christina, thank you so much for being on the Rat Race to Five podcast. I can't wait to get another recording maybe towards the end of the year and kind of see how your 2022 went. Thank you so much for being on. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. The Rap Race to Buy podcast, where we discuss money, mindset, real estate investing, and ways to achieve financial independence.
Whether you are a rookie or a veteran needing new ideas for investing or creating side hustles, you're in the right place. 